Let's pray together. Holy One, speak through me or in spite of me, that together we might receive your word and together we might become your people. For this we give thanks and work together in Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing grabs people's attention like a mirror. And when you walk into the sanctuary at Cape Town Methodist Mission in Cape Town, South Africa, there is a big one to greet you there. You see yourself in the mirror, you, you smile and, and say hello, and then above in big bold letters it reads, you are beautiful. And then as you smile and it feels nice, you look below at the bottom of the mirror and it says, and so is your enemy. Those twin truths in the same image remind us just how much of our faith is about understanding who we are and how others are, who others are in the light of God's grace and love. The book of Daniel that we read from this morning is also about identity. The Israelite people are in exile in Persia, and this book attempts to answer that identity question. Who are the Israelites during a time of cultural change and upheaval? And in response, the first half of Daniel gives us six stories in a row encouraging the Jewish people to stay true to their religion, their customs, their culture. And so, as they do, when they observe their dietary customs, when they reject idols, when they continue to pray to God, God protects them and things go well for them, even in exile. Our story this morning is from the sixth of those stories in that succession. It's the finale of the first half of the book, and again we see a similar theme. Stay true to your faith, your heritage, your people, and if you do, God will protect you even from the mouths of lions. To be honest, this story reminds me of another of my favorite books from the Bible, the story of Esther. Her story, too, is one about identity and exile and how following God will protect you during those kind of change moments. Those are both optimistic stories. We can keep our identity, things the way they were, even in periods of transition. God will protect our nation, even in exile. Which is why, if I'm frank, I always find the endings to both of these stories a little disturbing. In Esther's story, God saves the Jewish people from genocide through Queen Esther, but then the violence that was avoided is turned toward her enemies. The book's ending tells us that 75,000 of their enemies were put to death, which for me kind of ruins this beautiful story all about God stopping mass murder. And in a similar way, that's what happens in Daniel's story the way we just read. I think that's why Jenny might have cut off that ending. It's scary when we read it. God protects Daniel from the lions, but after he is freed, Daniel does not lobby for anti-lion den laws in the nation. Instead, he is silent as the king gives the command, and those who accuse David, as well as their spouses and children, are killed by the lions in Daniel's place. And when I read that, I have to ask, couldn't those angels that protected Daniel, couldn't have God have sent them to stop this bloodshed too? Couldn't those angels have changed the hearts of, of David or the king so that they'd recognize it's wrong to kill no matter whom we're killing? These aren't easy stories for us in the Bible. I think we have similar stories in our own lives. But as we read this Bible passage, I think we have to return to this question of identity as we make sense of it. Daniel and Esther and certainly other books of the Bible, too, are offering God's people a recounting of how this identity negotiating works during times of change. There aren't easy answers, but the important question, I think, for us today is why does violence against our enemies so often creep back into these stories we tell about who we are and about who our neighbors are, about who belongs and who doesn't? And I think that maybe the miracle God is offering us today is not only to close the mouths of lions that threaten us, but to close the need for revenge in our own hearts as well. I think Jesus says something like that. 
The Pharisees were worried about identity too. They were worried about who Jesus was and who they were called to be under Roman occupation. And so they asked Jesus the sneakiest of identity questions. They asked him not, who are you, but what's important to you? What's important to us? They asked him which commandment is the greatest, and Jesus says in response that the greatest commandment is to love God with all that we have, with all that we are, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Those were the priorities of faith that shaped his identity and the identity of his disciples. And as I think back over these last several years of tumult, I think those priorities of Jesus shaped one of his followers a few thousand years later in my hometown. Her name was Elizabeth Weller, Welliver, forgive me. She was a Christian and a college student at a Presbyterian college, at Davidson College in Concord, North Carolina. And because of her faith, she took Jesus' words to heart. She knew that Christians have to say something when rather than loving our neighbors as ourselves, we turn them and fear them as enemies. And one of Elizabeth's neighbors happened to be her best friend, Gabriel. Gabriel loved the Chinese language, Gabriel loved reading poetry, and Gabriel also happened to be an undocumented immigrant. And so when Donald Trump came to my hometown in 2016, the town right next to her college, she knew that she had to go. And when the crowd started chanting, build the wall, she and her classmates, other Christians from David College, Davidson College, joined their hands, raised them above their heads, and said, love thy neighbor." Love thy neighbor. It makes me think of the United Methodist Bishop Hope Morgan Ward. She asks us to notice the language that the Bible uses to describe miracles. Rather than calling them miracles, there's a word for that in Greek, often, especially in referring to Jesus' ministry, the Bible calls them signs and wonders instead. And Hope Morgan Ward, a bishop from another tradition, reminds us that this points not toward a reversal of natural law, a defiance of science, a, a serious feat of instantaneous lion taming, but rather the Bible literally tells us that these are signs. They point us toward God's future, God's dream, where wholeness and well-being are available to all of creation, strangers and enemies included which takes us back to Daniel and makes me wonder about how we should describe the story of, of him and the lions. Is it merely a singular miracle that God protected Daniel from unjust violence and death? Or is it a sign that points us toward a deeper truth that God wants to save us from our patterns of violence and revenge? This morning, I want Daniel and Esther, and all of us, myself included, to see what Elizabeth Welliver saw. I want all of us struggling to figure out who we are and who God is calling us to be, to see both sides of that mirror. We are beautiful. Our enemies are too. And neither of us belong in a lion's den. Let's write a new story together. Please pray with me. Holy One, you know where our hearts are this morning. If we need to be reminded that we are beloved, that we are held, that we are claimed, help us hear those words. And at the same time, sing to us the song that those we fear, those we don't know, those we just haven't met yet are too. Make that be so in this space, in this church, in this community. Make it be so in our own hearts. Together we pray and work in Jesus' name. Amen.